Levy on inductive risk, a critique of the argument from inductive risk. And um, this will be the last talk of the semester and the last talk of the of this uh, 2023 year. We will start again the lunchtime talks at the center in January on the 19th, going to be our first lunchtime talk. If you plan to be applying to the center, either as a postdoctoral fellow or as a visiting fellow, the deadline for application is December 10th. So please uh, send us an application. We would love to uh, host you uh, next year. Today, it's my uh, great pleasure to uh, uh, introduce uh, Ioannis Votsis, who is senior lecturer at um, um, Northeastern University London is also a fellow at the Department of Philosophy, Logic and Scientific Method at LSE. Um, Ioannis uh, was a, a visiting research fellow at the center a few years ago, and we have a fond memory of his uh, visit here at the center. It was a wonderful, wonderful time. And we're delighted that he agreed to uh, join us back uh, for this uh, serious uh, featured form of fellows where we bring back uh, uh, philosophers who have spent time here at the center. Uh, Ioannis worked in uh, the philosophy of uh, science, focusing on some of the core questions in philosophy of science is written extensively on structuralism, including some very influential papers on the matter. But his work is really broad in philosophy of science. His, his return on under determination, theory laden, ladenness, confirmation, and uh, unification and coherence. His interests also go beyond uh, the philosophy of science with work in the philosophy of language, the philosophy of logic, uh, metaphilosophy, and uh, more uh, recently, I believe, a uh, work as an intersectional philosophy of mind and also philosophy of uh, AI. He has published more than 30 articles on all of these topics in, um, you know, people always say that, but it's true, in the best journal in, in the field, uh, including uh, philosophy of science, philosophical studies, uh, studies, and synthesis. Um, thanks for uh, uh, coming back, Yanis. It's a real pleasure to, uh, to have you uh, here with us today. Floor is yours. Thank you. Um, shall I wait for you, uh, Edouard? Are you going to go back to the, the you're going to go to the? Go ahead. It's going to take me a minute. All right. Okay. Yeah. So um, let me just start by saying um, I'm very grateful to have this opportunity and to uh, have very fond memories of the center. So I'm very happy to return in some virtual form to give a talk. Uh, I'd like to make a couple of corrections to, to my profile. Uh, so I'm no longer a fellow at LSE. That was a few years a few years back. Um, I'm now just a, an associate professor at Northeastern University of London. And um, today I'm going to talk to you about one area of interest of mine, which is within the philosophy of science, and that is um, analogical reason. Right. So, uh, and the title. Uh, so I think gives a little bit of a hint of um, what I want to talk about, and that is whether there are any universal criteria of analogical uh, reasoning, and um, whether there are any universal models of analogical reason. Okay, so let me get into it. Uh, so let me just... Okay, so uh, now one of the most common and oldest forms of reasoning in science and beyond is analogical reasoning, reasoning by analogy. Now, very roughly speaking, such reasoning exploits existing similarities between two domains of inquiry uh, to infer further similarities. Right? And uh, once you try and understand what analogical reasoning um, is all about, uh, two key questions keep coming up. And one is whether any of the proposed models, there are people who propose models of analogical reasoning. Um, so any of the proposed models out there are up to the task, they're adequate. Um, and if not, uh, what can we do to, to adjust them to make them better, right? Which is what usually people do in, in philosophy and also beyond philosophy, right? You, so you, you propose some model and then you start um, refining it and trying to get it to work better, to be more adequate. Um, and then the second, um, uh, the second uh, uh, question is, uh, is the search for a universal model uh, versus multiple localized models of analogical reasoning doomed to failure? Right? So we're going to look at some objections 
some reasons why someone may think that it is indeed do, uh, doomed to, to failure. Okay, so uh, let me just tell you a little bit about the, uh, the, so the aim is basically to try and make some headway in answering these two questions. It's a bit of a modest aim because it's a work in progress. So I would um, very much appreciate your feedback. I'm still, I have a paper. It's not, it's um, uh, It's going to go, to end up in a, in a volume on Wittgenstein and AI. So I deal with some issues with AI in that paper. I, I'm not gonna bring them up so much here. Uh, I will bring up Wittgenstein here. Uh, and uh, even though that paper is, um, you know, I have a draft, it's not yet ready. So I need to, I need to still work on some of the crucial bits. So hopefully I get some feedback anyway. So, so what's the structure of the uh, talk? I'm going to give you a little introduction into analogical reasoning. Then I'm going to give you some models of analogical reasoning together with some problems that they face. Then I will raise the uh, uh, material challenge, which is um, uh, based on Norton's work on the material theory of induction, uh, which he extends to the material to, to analogical reasoning. Then I will give you a uh, kind of a, an additional criterion that can be bolted on to existing models of analogical reasoning. So I'm not going to uh, propose a, a model of analogical reasoning myself. I think that the existing ones have something going for them, all of them. They have their own little problems here and there. Uh, okay, perhaps not so little, but I will um, add uh, uh, a criterion into the mix that people can bolt onto their pre preferred model of analogical reasoning. I'm gonna say a bit about what that criterion might be able to achieve. And then I will look at uh, another challenge by Wittgenstein. People are probably familiar with uh, Wittgenstein's family resemblance relation. I'm gonna show how this is a, a challenge to my uh, relevant conceptual uniformity criterion. And then I'm gonna uh, conclude with uh, some, some uh, more general remarks and a summary of the main points. Okay, so. Let's start with some uh, terminology and some use. So uh, very simply, people talk about in this debate, they talk about known or accepted similarities between two domains, uh, which they call the source domain and the target domain. Uh, these known or accepted similarities um, are cited typically to ground the analogy addition, right? So you start with the analogy, which is based on these similarities. Now, I put a star next to accepted because I'm going to sit. It is an important issue whether they should be known, they should be accepted, maybe some other qualification. But I'm just uh, putting this issue uh, aside. I'm just going to talk as if we're, uh, these are known similarities. Uh, and then so these would presumably ground the analogy. And then once you have an analogy between these two domains, um, the analogy can be employed to infer additional similarities between S and T, right? So for example, you might have, um, uh, you might be thinking of building the Golden Gate Bridge, suppose it's before it was built, and then you're, uh, you build a, uh, a source and then you have an idea of what the target is gonna be, and you might think, okay, I can use this structure and this material, and then you might think, that uh, if there's a certain torsional resistance in the model, perhaps that's going to be there's going to be a similar kind of resistance in the target system. Okay, so that's just a little example. It's a toy example from engineering. Uh, the rest of my examples are going to come from science, from sorry, from more uh, like uh, natural sciences, uh, physics, and biology. Uh, so um, another important issue to bring up here is the argument uh, that that analogical reasoning typically is conceived of in terms of in argument form, right? So it's typically construed an, as an argument where the premises assert the known similarities between S and T, between the source and the target, but also some additional properties or relations possessed by S, right? So you have some properties and relations that, in other words, are similar between S and T. And then you also have some properties or relations in S. And then the conclusion basically asserts that these additional properties that S has are also possessed by T. That's the inference, right? Uh, now, stated thus, these arguments are clearly non-deductive. So uh, the premises, the truth of the premises are not going to guarantee the truth of the conclusion. Still, we can ask whether uh, descriptively 
um, such arguments are given in the literature uh, are non-deductive. Uh, maybe some of them are, maybe some of them aren't. And we can also ask a question, uh, a prescriptive question of um, how should these arguments be given, right? Uh, in which form? Um, if it's non-deductive, should it be inductive in a narrow sense, abductive, and so on, right? So in what follows, again, I'm setting this issue aside, again, very important issue, um, but I just can't deal with everything at the same time, so I'm putting it aside. So for expedience, we're just going to assume that arguments are and should be inductive in form. It's some broad sense of the word inductive, so it includes also abductive, let's say, okay? But the next next step, it's useful to talk about um, the roles that analogical arguments play. And typically, people mention two roles, which are justification and discovery. Right? So, uh, so in justification, people sometimes say that they can be used to provide support for a conclusion, so actual confirmation for a conclusion. Uh, and indeed, um, as, 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 as some people have pointed out, so for example, Bartha points out that in some areas of research, uh, uh, that you can't really find evidence that easily. So, uh, so he says, for example, in fields such as archaeology, where we lack direct means of testing, they may provide the strongest form of support available, right? So um, especially when you don't have direct means of testing certain things, you might make an analogy, and that could be the strongest form of support. Whether or, you know, whether or not you like it, something we can discuss later on. I don't focus so much on this issue. But just to give you an example, I guess it would be you find some kind of um, artifact, and then you might hypothesize by analogy to other similarly looking artifacts what its function is, because you know uh, uh, that for the source, for let's say an artifact that was created, you know, in the 18th century, that's well documented. You know how it was used functionally, so you might infer that something that was uh, created in the fifth century um, uh, has the same uh, function. Right. Now, more frequently, these arguments are utilized to provide some initial plausibility uh, and only for heuristic purposes. Right. So they play a discovery role. Uh, in what follows, we're going to use the neutral term admissible or admissibility to denote the various roles such arguments play without deciding between one or the other, unless otherwise noted, because some people's are, uh, models are di directly targeting one function or the other. I mean, typically, and to, to the best of my knowledge, uh, if you're targeting justification, you're also including discovery, but not vice versa. If you're targeting discovery, you don't necessarily include justification. You make a more modest claim about it's it's just uh, a means through which you can establish some initial plausibility for discovery purposes, right? Okay. So let's get into the uh, models of analogical reasoning. Uh, there's four that I'm going to present here, so I'm going to try and go through them fairly quickly because this is not really exactly what I want to focus on. I just want to give you a good flavor. The first one is kind of a naive one. Uh, everybody's beating up on it. It's called the simple schema, uh, and we can uh, characterize it as follows. This is a quotation from Bartha, by the way, 2010, his book uh, called By Parallel Reasoning. Uh, uh, so basically, we can say an analogical argument from S to T is admissible in relation to some feature Q, if and only if, and then this just basically mimics what we said before about the premises in the conclusion, right? So premise number one, you establish some kind of similarity between S and T in some known respects. Premise number two, S has some further feature Q, and then you conclude from that that T also has that feature, or some feature uh, Q star which is similar to Q, right? Just to allow... Uh, maybe some variations to make it a bit more applicable, uh, this inference. But I mean, the objection here is obvious. And this is my own uh, example, but you can come up with these ad infinitum. Uh, this kind of um, model is a bit too liberal. It, it admits all sorts of things as being a, 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 a good analogical arguments. Uh, so here's an example. So in premise number one, we established that diamonds and chalk, chalk have the similarity, namely they're made up of carbon-based molecules. Uh, in premise number two, we say that diamonds have a hardness rating of 10 on the Mohs scale. 
Uh, this is a scale of hardness. That 10 is the highest, right? Uh, and then from this, we conclude that chalk has a hardness rating of 10 on the Mohs scale on the basis that uh, there is already an analogy between diamonds and chalk. I mean, I specifically chose this uh, example because uh, chalk, of course, is much less hard than, um, I think it it, it, um, it falls under calcites and that um, comes uh, to, it, it's given a, a rating of three. Okay, so let's look at something a bit more sophisticated. So uh, this is Mary Hesse's um, 1966 causal model. Uh, now she provides, uh, she imposes three conditions on analogical arguments, which are meant to establish justification for the inferred similarity, right? So she's specifically targeting justification. I think that includes also discovery. Um, uh, so the three conditions are basically as follows. First, you need, it's, this is also noticed, it's presented in tabular form. I could have presented it as an argument. It just uh, um, takes less space and typically it's presented like this. Um, uh, so we have the source and the target, and then the green double-headed arrow that's meant to be um, showing that there are horizontal, this is horizontal, right? Similarities between these properties Q1 to Qn of S and T, right? Uh, and these are meant to be observational similarities according to uh, Hesse. That's a little bit of a um, uh, restriction, maybe uh, it's a bit too strict there. Um, then the second condition is a vertical uh, condition, which uh, is imposed on only on the source. Basically, it says that uh, property uh, Qn plus one, which is the property we're going to infer that T also has. So that's the one in the last row, first column, let's say. Uh, uh, that one must be uh, uh, somehow causally related uh, so um, properties Q1 to Qn somehow must be causally associated with uh, property Qn plus one. Uh, and then finally, she also imposes uh, a condition which doesn't show up here on, the, uh, on this uh, tabular form, uh, which is that uh, no essential properties of causal relations in S must be disanalogous with T, right? So there must be no essential properties uh, that are in S that actually are disanalogous with T, right? Okay, so that's a, a step forward. It's clearly imposing additional re restrictions, so it's more strict. It's gonna, not going to be so easy to satisfy this model. And in fact, a lot of people think that it's too strict, right? So the model is thought to be too strict uh, because it requires, among other things, it requires, for me, it's also because um, of this requirement of observational similarities. It could be that... Uh, you have other similarities that um, are equally uh, useful, but um, uh, some people, most people complain about causal relations as opposed to uh, mere, uh, um, uh, including also correlations, right? Not, not excluding causal relations, but including also correlations. Okay, so um, an example that's given, this is not my example, um, is Benjamin Franklin's inference that metal rods attract, or rods more generally, attract light, lightning, lightning in the wild, just like they attract electrical fluid in the lab. So basically what's going on here in this quotation at the bottom, is a quotation from uh, Benjamin Franklin, um, where he basically says, look, electrical fluid is analogous to lightning in the following respects. Uh, it gives light uh, the color of the light is uh, similar, uh, it has a crooked direction, da 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 da, da, da. Uh, It fires inflammable substances and it has a sulfurous, uh, sulfurous smell, right? And on the basis of this analogy, he then draws an additional uh, inference from a property that is in S, that's the uh, drawing of the a machine he used, the electrostatic machine in the lab. And namely that property is that uh, the electrical fluid was attracted to a metal rod in the lab. And given that electrical fluid is analogous to lightning, then surely um, lightning, um, uh, you can have a rod out there uh, in the wild, in a sense, outside the lab, which can attract uh, lightning, right? And that was the basis of uh, a lot of people putting these rods uh, just to um, uh, minimize damage in uh, thunderstorms, okay? So the idea here again is that uh, causal relations might be a bit too too much an imposition 
on a model of analogical reason. Then there's a probability uh, uh, model. Uh, so I call this Mills probability mo model, MPM. So in a nutshell, basically, what this is saying is that similarities increase the overall likeness between the source and the target. Uh, and that makes uh, the inferred similarity more likely. Right? So it's a probabilistic rendition of the relationship between the analogy and the, uh, the, uh, the similarities, uh, the known similarities, and then the inferred similarity. Right? So here's a little quotation from Mill where he says, there can be no doubt that every resemblance by which he means not just any similarity, there's a qualification, uh, any similarity that's not recognized, that's not known to be irrelevant. That's his requirement. Right? Uh, so there can be no doubt that every resemblance affords some degree of probability beyond what would have uh, what would otherwise exist in favor of that of the conclusion. Right? Now, uh, MPM is too liberal again. As similarities, basically the problem here is that similarities that are not known to be irrelevant, but are still irrelevant, uh, can still go through. Right? So they can still play a role, which means that they can still increase the probability of the of that conclusion which is something obviously we don't want, right? So here's an example I uh, concocted myself. So um, these are two uh, varieties of plants. Um, on, the, on, on the left, you have Ligularia, Fischeri, and on the right, you have Caltha balustris. They look very much alike. Uh, so you can establish some kind of phenotypical similarities between the two plants. Uh, and then you may want to infer from this that given that Ligularia fischeri is edible, that Caltha palustris is also edible. But that would be to your own detriment and it might lead to your tragic demise. And that's exactly, unfortunately, what happens. Apparently, these are plants that you find in Korea um, and that people occasionally mistake uh, and uh, Caltha palustris is in fact poisonous. Right, so people people actually die every year. So uh, several people die every year because of making this mistake. Right, so not every similarity that's not recognized to be uh, irrelevant uh, uh, is going to uh, needs to increase the probability. Right, so there should be additional conditions rest, uh, restricting that. This is too liberal as it stands. Okay, finally, uh, we have Bartha's articulation model. So this covers, so once I talk about this one, it covers four uh, influential philosophical models. There are uh, models in the AI literature, but I don't have time to talk about any of these today, and I'm still working on those. Um, and it's use, it's interesting to see what um, practitioners uh, are doing with analogical reasoning and trying to automate scientific discovery. Um, okay, so let's look at Bartha's model very quickly. So basically, he targets discovery. He doesn't want to do uh, more than discovery. And uh, he says an analogical argument meets the requirements for prima facie initial uh, plausibility if, so he's only providing basically sufficient conditions. Uh, and then he says, uh, if there is an overlap, uh, there's this condition of overlap and this condition of no critical difference, Basically, what this comes down to, the first condition is just saying that there's at least one property in S used in the positive analogy. There must be at least one uh, property in S used in the positive analogy between S and T that's associated uh, either causally or probabilistically with the inferred property in S. So it's like, basically, it's like S Hess's causal condition but he opens it up to a causal or probabilistic relationship between uh, the properties cited in S to Q1 to, to Q to, to, through Qn and the Qn plus one, which is the inferred property in S. And then the second condition, the no critical difference is basically um, requiring that no S property that plays a role in that association uh, should be present in the negative. So no S property that actually establishes this connection between Q1 through to Qn and Qn plus one uh, in S uh, should be present in the negative analogy between S and T. So he also brings in this, um, this terminology from Keynes uh, between positive and negative analogies, right? So this, negative analogies are the disanalogies. That's the idea here. 
Now, here's an objection also to this model. Um, this may be a little bit unfair in that, that, that Dashti and, and others uh, complain that um, the, the, mo the, 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 the scope of the model is too strict. Uh, why? Because it doesn't do justice to the justificational aspects of scientific practice, right? But I mean, it was designed really to be uh, to target uh, discovery and not justification. So it's a little bit unfair in that respect. Um, uh, so, and then they mentioned that in scientific practice, analogical reasoning is employed to confirm hypotheses. It's employed in this justificational role and they bring up analog experiments. And what are these experiments? Well, these are performed on domains that are analogous to the targets um, uh, because the latter are epistemically inaccessible. So whenever you have a domain that's epistemically inaccessible, you try and perform an experiment uh, in uh, uh, some other domain, which is accessible. And in particular, you can do computer simulations, right? So they mentioned the example of using simulated experiments of black holes to decide the presence of Hawking radiation. Uh, okay, so those are the uh, four models I wanted to mention and their problems, some of their problems. Now I'm going to talk about Norton's material challenge. I can't, the room is too small there. I can't see if John is sitting there. Uh, I don't know if he still hangs around in the center. But um, so uh, Norton's material challenge goes as follows, right? Uh, well, first of all, let me set up the whole, you know, this whole context of uh, this reply, right? Now, you can imagine that an easy way out of the counter examples is to deny the existence of a universal model of analogical reasoning. You might just say, well, not, you know, not, so you need different models in different kinds of situations, right? So that's why you always get counter examples, right? So um, these models that you're proposing, they're good for some range of phenomena, but not for others perhaps, right? This also chimes well with the kind of pluralism that uh, people find in all sorts of areas in, in the philosophy of science. Right? Now, some philosophers um, suggest that different fields of research require different models. So they kind of relativize everything to the field of research. While, whereas others like uh, Norton suggests a more fine-grained approach where different research questions re require different models. Right? So it's much more fine-grained because even within the same field, let's say within physics, if, uh, if you look at a particular subdomain, a particular uh, domain of interest within that uh, field, you might find that it requires a different model, right? Okay. Uh, so if you're familiar with John's work, the material theory of induction, uh, he comes up with this very nice way of demonstrating how there's a problem uh, with um, straight up kind of inductive inferences and in his view, any kind of inductive inferences in that, um, uh, as you can see, you, you can have two structurally identical inferences these are both inductive inferences. Uh, and the one of them, the one on the left is very good, whereas the, the one on the uh, right is bad, right? So from some, some samples of bismuth melt at 271 degrees Celsius, you can infer uh, that all bismuth samples melt at 271 degrees Celsius, but you can't do the same thing with the melting point of wax, the one on the right. Now, on his view, the goodness of an inductive inference is grounded in matters of fact that hold only in particular domains. And I, I quoted this, gra so that grounded in matters of fact that hold only in particular domains, right? So these are uh, the facts that license these kinds of inference, again, using his own language, right? Um, so there are facts about bismuth, but not about wax that make it the case that all its samples behave in the same way uh, with respect to melting, and that's the idea. Now, of course, we're not really talking about induction per se here. We're talking more specifically about analogical reasoning. Um, but it's unsurprising to see that in his book. So, so he first published, I think, the material theory of induction in 2003. And then um, he has a number of other publications. But this culminates in 2021 with his book uh, on the material theory of induction, where he specifically targets also analogical reasoning, he says, uh, uh, which he considers to be a species of inductive reasoning. And he says, if analogical reasoning is required to conform only to a simple form formal schema, the restriction is too permissive. Inferences are authorized that clearly should not pass master. The natural response has been to develop more elaborate formal te templates that are able to discriminate more finely by capturing more details of, of various test cases. We've seen that already, right? With the, going from the simple uh, schema to uh, Hess's uh, causal model, for example. 
And he goes on to say, elaborations cannot escape the inevitable difficulty. Their embellished schema are never quite embellished enough. There is always some part of the analysis that must be handled without guidance from strict formal rules, right? In other words, you need ma the material stuff. You need to know uh, stuff about the world to determine whether or not a, uh, an inference is good, whether it's inductive or analogical, which is also a species of induction, as we said. Right, so he's attacking this kind of approach, uh, the universal kind of model approach to analogical reasoning. Now, uh, this is a challenge, and it should be taken seriously. Um, but uh, I want to also uh, point out that um, there is no impossibility. So it's actually very hard to show that a universal model is, in fact, completely and uh, and utterly. Uh, out of the picture, right? Nobody, has, to the best of my knowledge, has offered any impossibility proofs out there. Uh, and moreover, we shouldn't assume that the, uh, or at least no impos general impossibility proofs, right? Uh, we shouldn't assume that the trade-off, this is a related point, that the trade-off, so, so far we've seen, when we look at this, these models and their uh, object, the objections against them, you might see that there is a trade-off between making the model a bit stricter uh, and then you uh, maybe minimize some of the uh, incorrect analogies or making it a bit looser, in which case you maximize the correct analogies, right? Um, so there's a trade-off between these two, but we, should, we shouldn't also assume that the trade-off between these two is necessary. In other words, could there be potentially, in principle, or at least we should ask that question, could there be uh, a model that actually manages to both minimize the incorrect analogies and also maximize the correct ones. Yeah. Okay, so now here comes the part where I have some of some more original material, uh, and I'm going to talk about the relevant conceptual uniformity criterion. So let me start by making some preliminary remarks. So I'm going to propose uh, an additional criterion. And as I said before in my introduction, this can be a bolt on to existing models of analogical reason. Right? Now, the criterion is going to be conceived of as being universal, or as uh, at least um, aspiring to be universal, which means applying to all cases. Uh, so it's not going to do the job, let me be clear, by itself. right? It's not going to tell us whether or not a, an analogical inference is a good one by itself. right? Uh, in fact, even if you take it with the rest of crit the criteria, I think it's not going to be sufficient. right? We, I think there's still work to be done in uh, models of analogical reason. Having said this, if it is indeed, uh, it, if it does play somehow a necessary role, and there is a, a bit of an issue here, um, it gives us some extra hope that the universal model may still be reachable, right? Um, so uh, let's see. So let me uh, start by making a first pass at this uh, criteria, right? To say that the concept is uniform, first of all, what do we mean by that? Well, we mean that the things or tokens that it represents are homogeneous uh, in some respects, right? So uh, what do we mean by this? Well, there's a couple of things we need to eliminate, first of all, so that people don't misunderstand uh, uh, what we mean by this. First thing to eliminate is we reject the case where total homogeneity is required, as that would result in only one object falling under any given concept, right? So if we require that um, you have all the tokens under your uh, concept are completely homogeneous, they're completely identical to each other, let's say, there's only one uh, object, and you include also properties like spatial temporal properties and so on, then you will only end up with one object falling under a uh, concept, and that's not going to be very helpful, right? You em eliminate that case. You also do not, we don't need to require that uh, the, the tokens share most or many of their properties, as some of them may be irrelevant, right? So we just need relevant uh, properties to establish this homogeneity. So we're referring to some relevant uh, parts uh, or relevant properties of these uh, tokens, right? So the first pass at the, this criterion is to say, let's restrict concepts, the concepts we use in, in these arguments, in analogical arguments, to those whose tokens are uniform uh, in relation to properties that play a relevant role in explaining this additional property, the QN plus one, right? Let's, in other words, just to simplify, let's just take unif so. In these arguments, let's restrict the, the concepts that are being used to uniform concepts. 
and uniform with you know in this qualified way where we're just focusing on the uniformity that matters in explaining this additional property. So if we have this connection again, this uh, connection between properties Q one to Q n uh, uh, on the one side, and then Q n plus one on the other side. Remember, under the source, we need this kind of connection in Hesse's model, in, in uh, um, Bartha's model, and so on. Then we ask that um, uh, uh, the concepts are uniform and that they play a relevant role right? in, that, in that relationship, in that association. Right? So that's the first one. Now, there's already a problem for me for, with that first one. That's why I made more passes at it. Why? Because I do admit, and I'm going to come back to this issue in the next section, that uh, a lot of concepts out there are not uniform. And in fact, um, the concepts we're interested in, in science, quite a few of them would not be exactly uniform or exactly as uniform as we would like them to be. Uh, so we need to make some provisions in our formulation. So if we take that at least qualification into account, we might end up with a formulation as follows. So number two, restrict concepts to those whose tokens are approximately uniform or uniform, right? Um, with respect to the properties that play a relevant role in explaining Q and plus one, that's the same. Or three, maybe this is more like a probabilistic one. The more uniform the concepts in relation to properties that play a relevant role, the more likely the admissibility of the inference, right? Uh, again, making sure that also the other, uh, other things being equal, right? Making sure also that the other conditions come into play, right? Um, now, this is still work in progress. This is where I got to this. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts about this at the end. Um, other provisions may be needed, and I've been thinking about some other ones, uh, but we can come back to that later if need be. Okay. So let me try and motivate why this might be a useful concept to use. Ironically, Norton's analysis of what goes on in the bismuth wax example brings out the input of uniformity the import of uniformity to the surface, right? So because he says, and here's a quotation, all samples of bismuth are uniform just in the property that determines their, their melting point, namely their internal structure. Wax samples lack this uniformity in the relevant property since wax is the generic name for various mixtures of hydrocarbons, right? Now, uh, to elaborate a bit more on that, bismuth is a chemical element as such, it's, it's uniform with respect to the intermolecular forces needed to be overcome uh, for its melting point, for the melting point. That's how we determine mel melting point through inter intermolecular forces. Uh, how much uh, of those forces need, so how, how much energy do we need to expend in order to um, overcome these intermolecular forces? And wax is a more heterogeneous category. It's not uniform. Uh, with respect to those, uh, specifically, it's not uniform with respect to those intermolecular forces, and therefore it's not going to help us with the melting, and that's why uh, it's, it would not be. In fact, we could even reconstruct this as, a, as an analogical inference. I had it at some point, even in the paper, I think, where uh, since one of them is a good inference, let's make the inference also for the other for wax, but of course, this would be blocked with such a, a condition or a version of that condition of uniformity. Now, uh, I want to also tease materiality and locality apart, which is a little bit difficult to get one's uh, um, brain around this uh, uh, distinction here, but I'm gonna try and do my best uh, to, come to, to, to make it come across. Um, now, first of all, let me start by saying, okay, I think I agree with Norton that uh, uniformities and, uh, are material fa facts to be discovered, right? So I agree with that, right? Of course, we need to go out and look at the world. It would be crazy to think that a priori we can solve all these problems. We do need to go out and make discoveries, right? Having said this, notice that the um, relevant conceptual uniformity condition is blind with respect to the specific research question pursued, right? So it's not saying, under this research question, do this, and under this condition, do that. No, it's just saying, uh, use uni uniform concepts, relevantly uniform concepts. As such, it's not a local, but a universal condition, or at least aspires to be one. So whether or not it's a universal condition, it applies to all cases, uh, depends on, uh, well, the, the version of it, uh, and also whether it works in all uh, cases, and it somehow it contributes at least in all cases. Right. Um, so if it isn't it successful, then by integrating it into existing models, um, it brings us one step closer to universality. 
right? So I can also phrase this a little bit less polemically, and I can say uh, such models, if they have this additional criterion, are perhaps not as local as Norton would have us believe. So we don't need to answer here. We don't need to categorically say, okay, there's there's great hope out there for universal models. We just need to say, um, well, maybe there's an inkling of hope in this criterion uh, inching us towards that direction, let's say. Right? That's the less polemical way of putting it. Okay, let me now switch to Wittgenstein's family resemblance challenge. This is a challenge to uh, that wasn't formulated, obviously, uh, against my criterion, uh, but uh, I do uh, want to consider it. It is relevant, I think, so I'm going to talk about it uh, now. Okay. So Wittgenstein in the philosophical investigation, in investigations uh, famously repudiates the view that terms or concepts possess essences and should be given definitions, right? And he uses this famous example of games. He says, games, oh, there's so many games. There are ball games, card games, board games, you name them. Uh, it's pointless to try and find a definition that uh, all of them are gonna share because they are such a varied hodgepodge kind of collection of things. Uh, still, he doesn't mean to say that there's no similarity between those things. That would be crazy. Uh, even by his standards, it would be crazy, right? So um, game tokens have more to do with each other, obviously, than with most other things out there. So he states this relationship that they have to each other as a family resemblance relation, right? And of course, this has led to uh, influential movements in uh, cognitive uh, psychology and the study of categorization with prototype exemplar theory and so on. I had a slide I removed it. It's just too much, um, too much uh, detail that you probably don't need. Okay. Now, uh, how does this pose a challenge? Well, Wittgenstein's anti-definitional view, he's against definitions, giving definitions, effectively denies the uniformity of concepts. He says there's no such thing as uniformity of concepts, right? Notice here also that there's, there's more than a, an inkling of a, like a, a similarity between what Wittgenstein and what Norton do. Even though I checked the, uh, the book, I, uh, his whole book, and I couldn't find any reference to Wittgenstein. Um, it's funny because they're both, they both think that philosophers are unhealthily preoccupied with generality uh, and omit local facts, which in Wittgenstein's case, uh, the locality that matters is basically how you use language, right? So language use is important, meaning, so meaning as use, this expression that you may have heard of before, right? Anyway, that's an aside. Uh, importantly, on Wittgenstein's view, uh, tokens are uh, at best exhibit varying degrees of similarity and concepts are thus less than perfectly uniform. So uh, concepts just collect together in a sense some uh, um, tokens that have some degree of similarity between them. And now this presents a challenge to the um, uh, relevant uh, conceptual uniformity criterion. Why? Because it judges it to be somehow unsatisfiable, though this depends on the version because um, there is a version where you don't need to have actual uniformity. You can just strive towards uniformity and things. So analogical inferences get better and better if you strive towards it. Right? Okay. so. Uh, now let me assess this challenge, right? So first of all, we can start by conceding that much of what goes on in language is as Wittgenstein describes it. I think there's a lot of stuff that he says, which is actually right. So for, especially for everyday concepts, which have meanings and extensions with unclear boundaries and are best treated in terms of graded membership as uh, prototype theory does, right? Now, just because many concepts are like this, however, it doesn't mean that all concepts, including scientific ones, should be treated this way. Uh, and in fact, this could be as bad an inference by analogy as the ones that the analogical reasoning modelers are so desperate to avoid, right? So here I have a little illustration uh, down below where I say, well, if everyday concepts are this uniform, uh, then, so if everyday concepts and any, you know, uh, and let's say scientific concepts or any specific concept have similarity in all sorts of ways, right? They're all concepts. They have some properties relating to concepthood, let's say. And then you say, oh, but everyday concepts are this uniform. Therefore, this concept is also this uniform. I think that would also be premature uh, an analogy to make. Uh, why? Because uh, there are concepts and there are concepts. And we'll get to that in a second. 
Uh, but before we do that, let me first of all say that there is a way to undo uh, or at least dig a bit of a hole under the feet of Wittgenstein uh, by arguing from within, so from his own kind of perspective, uh, basically following his own methodology. Right? On this methodology, membership in a concept is decided through language use, remember, right? Uh, but if we look at uh, language use in science, uh, these concepts, there are concepts in science which are uniform, uh, and it's evidenced by the fact that definitions are demanded of them, definitions are given of them, and these are consistently followed, right? And some of the best-known examples concern the base concepts in the International System of Units, the SI, uh, these are the seven base units, uh, the meter, the second, the mole, the ampere, the Kelvin, the candela, and the kilogram. Now, this is, a, again, a little bit of an aside, but it's nice because it connects to this issue of the base units, right? Because Wittgenstein, again, in the philosophical investigations, is unconvinced by these concepts, and he launches the following complaint about the standard meter. He says, it's meaningless to ask if the standard meter is a meter long. Why is it meaningless for him to ask that? Because it's a physical object. It cannot be laid against itself. So you have one physical object. It's a platinum uh, uh, iridium bar. That's uh, what the standard meter uh, how it was uh, um, defined uh, back in the 50s, right? So it was this platinum iridium bar. So you couldn't take that bar and set it against itself. Uh, so you can't really even ask whether the standard meter is a meter long, right? It's a meaningless question to ask. Now, this uh, question is obviously out of date. This complaint is obviously out of date. Why? Because at the time, the standard meter was defined against an actual physical object, and it's no longer the case. In fact, all seven base units today are given definitions in terms of fundamental const constants and in terms of each other. So the standard meter is defined as follows. The meter is the length of the path traveled by light in vacuum during a time interval of uh, and you got that, that that small fraction of a second, right? So you have here uh, a constant, which is you know the speed of light, um, and then you have also uh, so that uh, uh, the reference to another base unit, the second. Okay. Now going back to the main point, uh, I'd like to say that there is some uniformity in nature, uh, and that comes in the form of natural categories and law-like relations. And that's necessary to have such uniformity because, um, I mean, I, by the way, I was thinking of not having this, you know, to also have to argue for this because I'm taking on quite a lot, but I thought, what the hell, let, let me just also do this one. Uh, let's have a discussion on this one. Um, so I think that uniformity in nature is necessary, some uniformity in nature, because without it, the world would be too much of a jumble uh, to make any sense of and predict, right? We wouldn't be able to predict the world if it was completely without any uniformity right, whatsoever. In fact, even Hume, who argues that causal relations and inductions are but mere projections of the mind, remember this uh, claim that Hume makes, assumes some uniformity. In fact, he assumes them in those precise arguments that he makes against the cause of relations and inductions. Well, why? Because he says, look, you experience that B follows A several times, and that's what leads you to the habit that B follows A, which means that some, you know, there is some uniformity, there is some range of B following uh, A which holds, uh, necessarily holds in a sense, right? It's not, uni okay, it's not universally holds those, uh, but even at, at least with, if you uh, circumscribe, circumscribe that, um, uh, um, that uh, range of uh, instances, then you could have full uniformity. Okay. Uh, okay, so I've reached the 45 minute uh, uh, mark, so I'm going to try and finish fairly soonish. So um, now we talked about uniformity in nature, now we're going to talk about capturing uniformity in nature, right? Uh, now, assuming that there are some natural categories out there, uh, some seem to be dynamic, they evolve, and some are static, right? Either way, whether they're dynamic or static, our attempts to capture them via concepts are almost guaranteed to vary over time, at least initially, right? So in other words, I'm trying to point out that um, it's not really a surprise or we shouldn't be too scared in finding out that, you know, these definitions change over time. Why? Because we do, uh, it, it is, a matter of epistemic investigation to figure out how these things work, these categories are for, uh, this, um, what the boundaries of the categories are. These victories, as we know with any other epistemic investigation are hard earned, 
which means that we require several successive refinements. And that's why these definitions shift over time. And you might even, uh, with, the, with the case of the SI base units and various other concepts, uh, you see this um, uh, process over time uh, tending towards, toward, towards more and more uniformity. Right? Now, I also like to point out the relationship between uniformity and truth likeness. Right? And I start with the static concepts. Now, uh, seeking and refining definitions, I'd like to say, uh, affects the truth likeness of proposed law like generalization. So it has a, a, a very, so it's important also to make sure that um, our definitions uh, are refined and, they're, um, uh, and they become the concepts we use are more uh, unified. Why? Because they ultimately actually affect the truth likeness of our uh, law like generalizations. Uh, so consider the following uh, law-like generalization, right? All neutrinos in interact with matter to produce electrons, right? This presumably has some truth content in it, but there are also exceptions. Why? Because there are muon neutri neutrinos that don't do that, and there are also tau neutrinos that don't do that, right? So these are exceptions. But we can start collecting evidence to justify more refined and unified concepts, and that's precisely what happened because even though at first we thought that there are only one type of neutrino, now we think that there are three types of neutrinos, electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos, and tau neutrinos. So now we can take those exceptions and we can exclude them. So, uh, and we do so by taking the more unified concept, namely that all electron neutrinos, and we, we formulate the universal generalization like that, right? The, the, sorry, the law-like generalization like that. All electron neutrinos interact with matter to produce electrons. Surely that increases the truth likeness of, general, of our generalization, even if in this particular case, who knows, maybe it needs further refinement, so it's not uh, true. It doesn't even have to be approximately true, actually. What all we need to do is just this to tend towards truth right, for this point to hold. Now let's take a case, uh, same kind of uh, consideration, but now we take dynamic concepts. Take the generalization, all birds fly. This is generally true, but fails with respect to penguins, uh, rares, ostriches, and emus, among other things. Right? Now, we could once again do the same uh, trick, right? Uh, define a more refined and unified concept. Let's say it's the F bird. Um, it's not a swear word, uh, I promise. Uh, but uh, we say F birds. What are the F birds? Well, the F birds are the things that fly, right? Um, so it, it excludes all the, or at least we say, you know, we list them somehow, right? And it excludes all the exception. Why don't we do that? Well, because the category itself is dynamic, right? So uh, animals evolve, and so more exceptions are likely to ensue, right? So we we that's that's just not gonna work, right? Um, we don't just want lists, of course. We want more um, kind of unified ways of describing this uh, the, uh, this these concepts. Uh, and in particular, in this case, we need a dynamic mechanism that when is incorporated, when it's incorporated into the concept keeps out the ex exceptions, right? Now in a complex system like evolution, it may be beyond our ability to find such a mechanism and enshrine it in a definition, but uh, I leave that as, a, as something for people to think about. Okay, so now I'm almost ready to conclude. Uh, so uh, let me just, say that, first of all, I think there's an advantage to the approach I'm taking here, which is, um, uh, it's not, I mean, the specifics of it might be wrong, the, the proposal, the way I uh, conceptualize, the way I understand this relevant uh, conceptual uniformity criterion, but the general approach I think is a good one because it makes these questions testable, right? So why? Because I'm really saying the goodness of analogical reasoning depends partly on the degree of the relevant conceptual uniformity, right? Uh, that is, other things being equal, right? If you keep all the other things constant, analogical inferences are less likely to succeed when the concepts involved uh, are less uniform. That's a prediction that we can make, right? Now, this can be tested via simulation, for example, by comparing inferences employing concepts with various, de various degrees of uh, re relevant conceptual uniformity. And we can do that. It's nice to do it in simulation. Why? Because you can have stipulated ground truths, and then you can see how uh, uh, when you take um, uh, concepts that try to somehow latch on to the ground truths and the ground concepts, the natural concepts, let's say, 
uh, how they can do better or worse if they're unified or uh, uh, less unified. Right? In fact, um, I'm currently designing such simulations with my PhD student to test how uh, machine learning algorithms are affected by feature choice. And feature choice is really uh, 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 corresponding to um, to concepts, right? So feature choice is like ve to the variables that we use in machine learning models. Okay, so then we have the question. So this is the uh, last slide before the, the summary of the main points. Uh, we might ask, why do analogical arguments work to the extent that they do in, in the times that they do, when they do, right? Why do they work? Bartha asked this question in his book. It's a book length treatment. So I was, you know, uh, would be surprised if he didn't ask this question, but he answers it in the following way. He says, the best answer I can give is that our models of analogical reasoning provide a forum that lets us debate about and ultimately identify the right critical factors and hence the appropriate invariance for establishing symmetry between the two domains. Now, I think that's a little bit uh, of a letdown. It doesn't really go, perhaps it's more modest, maybe it's better that way, but I think it kind of shortchanges the reader because ultimately, uh, I think that the reason why they work to the extent that they do is because nature cooperates, right? It's because there is considerable uniformity out there that we can exploit. And I think that's something also John would probably be happy to say because he would say, well, uh, uniformity is matter. It's just that he, he thinks that it's um, these are all local, right? Uh, which uh, uh, I don't, uh, I'm not objecting to that, right? Uniformity can be local, it's, that's not a problem. Okay, so now here's a summary of the main points. What, what did we do? Well, we explored four major models of analogical reasoning. We saw some of the problems. Then we lowered the prospects of a uh, universal model uh, via uh, finding universal model via Norton's material theory of induction and his objection uh, as applied to analogical reasoning. Uh, we then proposed a way to reduce the objection sting by positing the relevant conceptual uniformity criterion um, which we said uh, could be a universal criterion, right? Because it just requires event in any given uh, domain that you just find uh, concepts uh, that are uniform or strive towards that uniformity. Uh, we then question the satis satisfiability of this uh, uh, relevant conceptual uniformity criterion with Wittgenstein's family resemblance metaphor. Uh, we argued that some concepts are approximately uh, uniform or approximately uniform and that scientific inquiry strives towards such uniformity. There is some uniformity in nature. Uh, and we concluded by saying that the reason why analogical reasoning works in some cases is that nature does exhibit some repetition in its blueprint. There is some uniformity in nature and some, uh, sorry, and also some uh, repetition uh, across domains. Uh, and that's why we can exploit it and make um, good analogical inferences sometimes. Okay, so that's it. All right. On behalf of everyone, let me just clap since uh, people can't really clap. Could you just get us out of the the whole the whole screen so that we can uh, uh, see each other? So let me remind you how we're going.